How can you calculate functions like e to the x, sine of x, or cosine of x at any point? I mean, how do calculators actually do this? This question occupied my mind for a long time. Because when you type sine of 0.7 into a calculator, it instantly gives you the result. Or something like e to the power of 2.7, which seems like a very hard number to compute. Do calculators have some sort of database? Do they look up the values we type in? That can't be true, because I can change these numbers in millions of different ways. These are not simple arithmetic operations like addition, subtraction, or multiplication that computers can directly perform through their circuits. So there must be something else going on, but what? The answer lies in one of the most beautiful ideas in mathematics, the Taylor series. Taylor series is one of the most powerful tools mathematics offers. It allows us to represent functions that appear everywhere in math, physics, and engineering as polynomials, which are much easier to deal with, while keeping the error extremely small. In essence, the Taylor series lets us find polynomial versions of functions that are not polynomials, within certain regions, and with very small errors. Why do we want polynomial versions? Because polynomials are much easier to handle, they're easier to compute, easier to differentiate, and easier to integrate. Let me show you how this theorem works using the cosine function. Calculating the cosine function at x equals 0 is easy, because cosine of 0 equals 1. So this function passes through the point 0, 1. The derivatives of the cosine function are also easy to find. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. The derivative of negative sine is negative cosine. The derivative of that is sine, and then it repeats again and again. And the values of these derivatives at x equals 0 follow a very neat pattern, and they're easy to compute. Our goal is this, to find the polynomial that best resembles the cosine function around x equals 0. In other words, among all possible polynomials, we want to find the one that most closely matches cosine near 0, say a polynomial like a plus bx plus cx squared. Of course, we can keep adding more terms if we want. First of all, if this polynomial is going to be any good, it must pass through the point 0, 1, right? Because we're looking for the polynomial that most closely resembles cosine at that point. Since cosine of 0 equals 1, when we plug x equals 0 into the polynomial, it must also give 1. Since the values of b, c, and all the following terms contain x, they're all multiplied by 0, so they disappear. What remains is only a. Therefore, a should be equal to 1. Now we can adjust b and c freely. But no matter what we do, the polynomial will always pass through the point 0, 1. And of course, infinitely many polynomials can pass through that same point. That doesn't help us much. The error is large. But if we can also make the slope of our polynomial match the slope of cosine at that point, they'll resemble each other more closely. Otherwise, the polynomial just drifts off too much to the sides. The derivative of cosine x is negative sine x, which equals 0 at x equals 0. So it is a perfectly flat line. The derivative of our polynomial a plus bx plus cx squared is b plus 2cx. At x equals 0, the slope is just b. That means we can make the polynomial slope any value we want by changing b. But in this case, we want it to be 0, because cosine slope there is 0. Perfect. Now we've matched both the position and the slope. But we can still create infinitely many such polynomials by just changing the c. Still, by fixing a and b as we did, we've locked the polynomial onto the point 0, 1 with a flat slope. You can probably see where this is going. If matching the first derivative made the polynomial more accurate, then matching the second derivative should make it even better, right? The second derivative of cosine is negative cosine, and at x equals 0, its value is negative 1. The second derivative of the polynomial is 2c. If we set that equal to negative 1, we get c equals negative 1 half. Here is the polynomial we were looking for, 1 plus 0x minus 1 half x squared. It doesn't look much like cosine, does it? But to see how well this polynomial approximates cosine, suppose you want to compute cosine of 0.1. Using this polynomial, it gives you 0.995. The true value of cosine of 0.1 is this. Isn't that wonderful? Like magic. And we only calculated up to the second degree. By adding more terms, you can increase the accuracy as much as you want. Let's add one more term, a cubic term, dx cubed. We'll make sure the third derivative of the polynomial matches the third derivative of cosine. Notice something. When we take the third derivative, any terms with degree less than 3, like 1 minus 1 half x squared, disappear. In the end, it's always just the term we're interested in that remains. Now look carefully at how we take this derivative. 
First, we bring the 3 down to the front and reduce the exponent by 1, that's the first derivative. Then, we bring the 2 down and reduce the exponent again, that's the second derivative. Then, we bring the 1 down and reduce the exponent once more, that's the third derivative. Now there's x to the power 0, which is simply 1. Notice that when we took the third derivative, we multiplied the constant by 3 factorial. Keep that in mind, we'll use it soon. The third derivative of cosine is sine, and at x equals 0, it is 0. If we want these two to be equal, then d, the constant, must be 0. That means our polynomial already matches cosine up to the third degree, which is why the approximation was so good. To better understand and derive the general form of the Taylor series, let's add one more term, a fourth degree term, e times x to the fourth. Again, we'll try to make the fourth derivative of cosine resemble the fourth derivative of this polynomial. The fourth derivative of cosine is itself, and at x equals zero, its value is one. In the polynomial's fourth derivative, all terms of degree less than four will become zero, so we only need to consider the x to the fourth term. To take its fourth derivative, we bring the exponent down four times and decrease it each time. At the end, we're left with x to the zero, which is one. Interesting, isn't it? Just as we encountered three factorial when we took the third derivative, now we get four factorial for the fourth derivative, that's 24. We need this expression to equal one, so the constant e must be 1 over 24. This polynomial, whose graph looks like this, approximates cosine around x equals zero with astonishing accuracy. Now to fully understand what's going on and to write the general form of the Taylor series, let's recall what we've done. Our goal was to find a polynomial that resembles cosine x as closely as possible at x equals zero. Cosine at zero equals one. So our polynomial should also pass through the point one. And at this stage, the polynomial looks like this. Then, to represent the first derivative, we added a term containing x. But to cancel out the effect of taking derivatives, we divide it by the factorial of the exponent. The first derivative of cosine is negative sine, which equals zero at x equals zero. Therefore, we also want that term in our polynomial to be zero. That's not a very good approximation yet. For greater precision, we can add more terms. So we added a second degree term, x squared, divided by two factorial to cancel out the effect of taking two derivatives. The second derivative of cosine is negative cosine, which equals negative one at x equals zero. So the coefficient of the x squared term should be negative one. Now the polynomial looks like this, much better. We can keep going. Let's add a third degree term, x cubed. The third derivative of cosine is sine, and at x equals zero, it's zero, so the coefficient of this term is also zero. I think you see the pattern. Let's add the fourth degree term, the fourth derivative of cosine is again cosine, and its value is one, so the coefficient of this term is one. Now the polynomial takes this shape. So by following these same steps, you can find the Taylor series for any function that's given to you. For instance, let's say you're given a function like this. What you need to do first is compute its derivatives as many as you need, depending on how accurate you want your approximation to be. Then, you calculate the value of each derivative at x equals zero. In this way, you can find the Taylor polynomial that approximates your function. Here, the f of zero term ensures that the polynomial passes through the same value as the function at zero. The next term ensures that the slope, the first derivative, is also the same. The second derivative term is added to make the curvature match as well. By adding these terms one by one, the polynomial imitates the function's behavior with increasing precision. The more terms you include, the better the approximation becomes. Of course, you don't have to write the Taylor series around x equals zero. You can form a more general Taylor polynomial. Suppose you want the polynomial to approximate the function around a different point. Let's call that point A. First, compute the derivatives of the function at x equals A up to the degree you want. Then, write the Taylor series in powers of x minus A. That's the most general form of the Taylor series. By changing the value of A, you can make the polynomial match the function around any point you like. The Taylor series is a fascinating way to predict the behavior of a function using only derivative information at a single point. Computers can't directly calculate trigonometric, logarithmic, or exponential functions. They rely on Taylor series to find approximate values. Taylor series are used to convert complex functions, which appear in mathematics, computer science, physics and engineering, economics, and artificial intelligence, into approximate polynomial forms. In the next videos, we'll use these series to prove other important theorems. See you soon.